Hey, this is Father Steve, Episcopal Priest, uh, as you know, serving here in the Episcopal Diocese of Maryland. And we have been studying the book Revelation, and this recording will be the last one. Uh, we're going to cover chapters 21 and 22. There's 22 chapters in the book of Revelation. And those who have been sticking with us through this understand that we have to um, open our minds a little bit to understand what's going on. And we been very methodical about doing this and, and even in person, uh, in person Bible study, uh, we have to do very methodical. Um, it's not a, it's not a, a, a thing where to study any scripture, but to study the book of Revelation to, to sit down and do this in two days and um, say a, a, a one hour class each week. We've gone through methodical. So what we're going to do in this um, last recording, we're going to do uh, chapters 21 and 22 of uh, Revelation. And um, so what I'd like you to do is go ahead and um, read um, chapters 21 and 22. Now, if you need to make this um, recording uh, multiple times to, to go through the questions that will actually come out of N.T. Wright's book, um, you will probably want to do that. But I'm putting these two chapters together. And um, so go ahead and uh, read chapters 21 and 22. Then come back and I'll go through my notes and then we'll go into the questions from N.T. Wright's book on the study of Revelation. Okay, so welcome back. You know how to pause this. Um, hit that number 11 or up, down, equal sign, whatever you want to call it. Okay, so we're going to look at uh, chapter 21. And then we'll take a look at chapter 22. So chapter 21 is the new world and the new Jerusalem. This is the high point of the book of Revelation and new creation. In verse 3 of chapter 21, one of the four living creatures gives an explanation of the new creation, that being the dwelling of God. In verse 5, this is the only passage in Revelation where God himself speaks, See, I am making all things new. He describes that everything in verses 1 through 4 will be accomplished where we hear these words, for these words are trustworthy and true. And then we go on a little bit from chapter from uh, chapter 21, verse 9, through chapter 22, verse 5. The spouse of the Lamb and the heavenly Jerusalem. So, let's look at chapter 21 first, and then we'll go into chapter 22. So, just a little introductory from uh, N.T. Wright's book. He writes um, for... Uh, uh, chapter uh, Revelation 21, verses 1 through 21. There are some moments in life when we say to ourselves, everything is going to be different now. This is entirely new. This is a whole new world opening up. We might think of some major life events, birth, marriage, full recovering from a long and dangerous illness, the experience of someone new coming to live with you. John has, on a cosmic scale, such moments in mind as he builds up this breathtaking picture of the new heaven and new earth. I will be his God and he shall be my son, a final new birth. The holy city is like a bride dressed up for her husband, a wedding. There will be no more death or mourning or weeping or pain anymore, the great recovery. And central to this whole picture, and indeed explain what it all means, is the great promise. God has come to dwell with humans, the new permanent guest. As with all symbolism, these are signposts pointing into the unknown future. And at every point, John is saying, it's like this, but much, much more so. So, kind of an icebreaker question um, for uh, chapter 21. When has there been a moment in your life when you have said to yourself, everything is going to be different now? Everything is going to be different now. Okay, so let's... Uh, Let's go on and look at verses 1 through 5 of chapter 21 of Revelation. What does John say, what does John see coming down out of heaven? And that's more in verse 2. What does John see coming down out of heaven? And that's verse 2. And then in verse 3, what does it mean that God will dwell with his people? Verse 3, what does it mean that God will dwell with his people? Okay, we follow along. All right. 
verses 3 and 4. Which of the promise offered in verses 3 and 4 offers you the most comfort and hope right now and why? When we look at verses 3 and 4, chapter 21, what offers you the most comfort and hope right now and why? All right, so moving on. What we have in Revelation 21 and 22 is the utter transformation of heaven and earth by means of God, of God abolishing from within both heaven and earth everything that has to do both with as yet incomplete plan for creation and more particularly with the horrible, disgusting, and tragic effects of human sin. Up to now, the one who sits on the throne has been mentioned only obliquely. He has been there, he has been worshipped, but all of the talking has been done by Jesus, or by an angel, or by a voice from heaven. Now, at last, for the first time since the opening statement in chapter 1, verse 8, God himself, directly and without intermediary, addresses John, and through him addresses his churches and ours. What is the message that comes from the one who sits on the throne himself? What is the message? That's verse 5. And we're moving on there. What is included in all things? What is included in all things? Okay. A question. What difference should it make in how we live now to know that God's ultimate purpose is real all things of this present existence? I'll repeat that question. What difference should it make in how we live now to know that God's ultimate purpose is to renew all things of this present existence. Think about reconciliation. It's never too late. Think about that. Okay, so now we're looking at um, chapter 21, verses 6 to 21. And more particular, verses 12, verses 12 to 14. How is the New Jerusalem specifically designed to reflect the identity of God's people? How is the New Jerusalem specifically designed to reflect the identity of God's people? I'm looking at verses 12 to 14 on that. Okay, so I think that is enough uh, for us to t be looking at chapter 21. Now we're going to move to chapter 22. Okay, so um, going back, we need to read, um, read chapter 22. Go ahead and look at it now, and uh, come back to uh, come back to us here. Okay, welcome back. Now, chapter 22, verses 6 to 21, the epilogue. This is the epilogue. Okay, verses 6 to 9, witness of the angel. The angel speaks once again. The angel is probably the same one mentioned in Revelation right where we started. The angel is probably the same one mentioned right when Revelation started in chapter 1, verse 1. Okay? In verse 7 of chapter 22, See, I am coming soon. This is the voice of Christ. See, I am coming soon. Now, in chapter 22, when we look at verses 10 to 15, we have the time of retribution is at hand. The time of retribution is at hand. More particularly in verse 11, each person must accept the consequences of a decision freely made. And damnation will be nothing more than the wages of repeated and definite rejection of God's invitation. It's sad to say that people will continue to reject God's invitation. Okay, so in chapter 22, verses 16 to 20, we have the witness of Jesus Christ. More particular, verse 17 of chapter 22. The Spirit and Bride say, the Spirit of God speaking through the prophets. And then verse 18 and 19, Jesus himself enunciates the warning. Here we have Jesus himself enunciating a warning. Chapter 22, verse 21, the salutation. And this resembles 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 18. If you want to go back and look at that. And then the last word 
of Revelation recalls. Last word of Revelation recalls Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. The last word of Revelation we hear recalls Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, and that is Amen. Okay? So let's uh, see what N.T. Wright has about the last chapter of Revelation. God and Lamb are there. As we reach the end of this most, re this most remarkable books, we realize we have only skimmed in it and in the interest of time and space. Yet we are aware of the depths we have glimpsed as we have sped by. The sequence of events, the letters, the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls, and all that went with and around them may have emerged into one in our memory. It may seem like a glorious, wild, ancient sound pointing us back to the very dawn of time in the most ancient of scriptures, yet also pointing us to things yet to come in God's ultimate future. But out of this rich confusion of vision and image, two or three notes now stand out. Emerging variously from all that has gone before, part of the music, and yet without, yet with something else to say. Pay attention. Keep these words. I am coming soon. I am coming soon. So, an icebreaker question for chapter 22. What have you sensed God trying to say to you in the midst of this remarkable book? Again, we have in, in in person. We have studied this, and we have got we have received so much information. Now, this is uh, for for maybe somebody to say that they were not learning or whatever. It, you know, part of it is you have to understand one as we start. It's a, it's a mystery book. It's a lot of symbolism. We have to open our mind, uh, get in dialogue uh, with people in our class that we do in person. Um, but this is a remarkable book. Okay, now we're going to look, um, skip back a little bit to chapter 21, verse 22 to chapter 22, verse 7. Okay, so you may have to, uh, I know we're predominantly going to be in chapter 22, but this is a combined class. So when we look, why are the temple and the sun and the moon absent from the New Jerusalem? And looking at 21 verses, chapter 21, going back, Verses 22 to 23, why are the temple, the sun, and the moon absent from the New Jerusalem? Also, while you're doing this, those who have attended Episcopal um, burial offices and uh, funerals will say, well, this sounds very familiar. Yes, it does. Second question. In what way did the ancient temple in Jerusalem serve as a signpost to something greater? In what way did the ancient temple in Jerusalem serve as a signpost to something greater? And in what way did the sun and the moon themselves act as signposts in that way? Okay. All right, here we go. Slowly we rub our eyes and discover that even the glorious world of Genesis 1 was the beginning of something rather than an end in itself. It was itself a great signpost pointing to the world that God always intended to make out of it. How does this help, how does this help us understand and appreciate more deeply the world we live in? I think it's also, um, in thinking this, this came up to my mind, you know, a lot of us know what John 3.16 says. God so loved the world, he gave us signs, I know that, right? But a lot of us in there and fail to realize that John 3.17 is that God loved the world. He didn't come to condemn it. He loved the world so much. Just think about that. Okay. So, question. For most revelation, the nations and their kings have been hostile they have shared in the idolatry and economic balance of Babylon. They have oppressed and opposed God, his purpose, purposes, and his people. But the earlier hints of God's water redeeming purpose now come fully into play. And looking at verses 24 to 26 of chapter 21, how will the nations participate in the life of New Jerusalem? This is to, um, chapter 21. Verses 24 26. How will the nations participate in the life of New Jerusalem? Okay. Still in chapter 21 here in verse 25. Why are the gates of the city never shut? Why are the gates of the city never shut?
All right, still in chapter 21 here, verse 27. That which ruins the beauty and holiness of God's new city is ruled out by definition. What is specifically mentioned here, look at 21, 27. That which ruins the beauty and holiness of God's new city is ruled out by definition. What is specifically mentioned here? In a follow-up to that, how might we begin to prepare ourselves even now for life in this holy city? Okay. I have one more question, and then we, well, two, <laughs> two questions. From the start of the book, Revelation, we were told that the Lamb's followers were to be a royal priesthood, and now we see what this means. It is from the city, the city which is the bride, the bride which is the Lamb's followers. That healing, restorative stewardship is to flow. This is how the great, how the Creator God will show once and for all that His creation was good and that He Himself is full of mercy. How might we begin to participate in this healing of redeeming work today? How might we begin to participate in this healing, redeeming work today? Okay, now one more question. How might we live in joyful expectation of the day when Jesus comes? <laughs> it's a good way to finish out the, our study of the book of Revelation. How might we live in joyful expectation of the day when Jesus comes? So there we go. We've studied the book of Revelation. <laughs> so anyway, um, God bless. And um, we're just going to be more uh, Bible study series coming. I'm not exactly sure what's coming up next. Um, I'm going to be talking to some of my in-person in Bible study people um, and see what they want to do. God bless.